namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa I had a request to talk on the topic of transformation this evening. That's a theme that ties in to the Buddhist teaching of Anicca, uh, the law of change, the characteristic of change, of impermanence, that everything is in a constant state of flux, there's no stability to be found anywhere from moment to moment. And this applies to all, all phenomena in the conditioned world. Everything is constantly in a state of change from one level or kind of existence to another. You consider a, a tree that starts as a as a seed that drops on the ground and sprouts and becomes a sapling and then it becomes a, a big mighty tree and then it ages and becomes less effective in its existence and fungus and insects take over and the tree falls down and then moss grows on it and more fungus and animals burrow into it eventually it dissolves into the soil. The same constant churning of beings from birth through to death, it applies to to uh, human beings as well as to the whole animal and plant kingdom. And even the Dewas have a limited lifespan, although it's very long by our standards. Even the fabric of the cosmos, the planets and the stars have a life cycle. They're constantly in a state of change from one state of being to another. They're transforming constantly. The output of the sun is constantly variable. The continents on the earth are drifting Just because in some of these cases the change is happening at a time scale that we can barely perceive because of the shortness of our lives, it doesn't make it any less real as a kind of transformation. This existence in the conditioned world, we refer to it in Buddhism often as sangsara, which comes from the verb Sansareti, as we find as a kind of a general rule in Pali language that most of the sort of abstract nouns are actually derivatives from verbs. Samsareti in this case means uh, to wander uh, with the uh, connotation of wandering aimlessly in circles. And the beings in samsara are constantly changing form. In the iconography of the Wheel of Life, which we have uh, one fine example hanging in the library, but there's other ones around. The uh, second wheel from the center shows beings rising and falling. This is... Um, possibly linked in origins to the tarot card of the Wheel of Fortune. The tarot cards originally being a gypsy provenance and gypsies originated in India, so there could be some direct connection there. And certainly that uh, Wheel of Fortune card represents a samsara of beings rising and falling. So in the transformations of beings over spans of lifetimes, beings are constantly being reborn into different forms of existence depending on their kama. 
and without the instruction or impulse of of a spiritual path of the Dhamma, then the natural tendency is to go in circles. And there are many stories in the Dhammapada commentary, for example, that can illustrate this principle that someone has made good merit in one lifetime and then they're reborn into a fortunate birth, either as a wealthy human of the noble class or even as a deva, but then they fritter away their existence, enjoying the pleasures of that state without taking heed to the future and end up being reborn into a lower state after that. There's one story in the Dhammapada of a a rich man who was a miser. There's a few of these stories about misers in the literature. It seems like the, the miser was a particularly despised kind of state of being that one has acquired great wealth and hoards it and in some of these cases, the miser doesn't even spend it on his own enjoyment. He just is like Scrooge McDuck. He's got a big vat full of money and doesn't want to part with a single penny. In this case, the miser had a daughter who was a follower of the Buddha. And when the uh, the monks came on their arms round, the miser just shooed them away from the door. and And the daughter said, you might as well move on, good sirs. My father is living off his capital. And then the father asked her to explain what she meant. And he said, well, you've made a a stock of merit in previous lifetimes and you're enjoying the benefits of it now, but you're not making any further merit. So when your merit runs out, you'll come to a sorry state. So there's one thing to bear in mind about transformation. The first is that it's, it's always happening. It's unavoidable. We're constantly in a state of of change from one uh, one state of existence to another. But the second thing to contemplate and to keep in mind is that the the direction of the transformation can be either to a higher level or to a lower level. And at each moment, actually, what we're doing, how we're holding our our mind, our consciousness, and what our actions are, is creating tama that's either pushing us upwards or downwards. There's no stagnation. We're moving either upwards or downwards in each moment. Another aspect of transformation or change to consider is that because it is unavoidable efforts to stop change or transformation from occurring are going to be fruitless and are going to lead to suffering and this is actually a very big factor in the subjective experience of suffering of beings in the world that their circumstances change, which inevitably they do, and this causes them grief because they're attached to the situation and the circumstances as they exist at this moment. And beings will put a great deal of effort into trying to maintain mm-hmm. the stability of a state of being and avoid change. And these efforts are inevitably frustrated. And it doesn't matter how much effort is put into resisting change, it will just cause more suffering. The Taoists have a um, a wise approach to this idea. They they talk about you know, being in harmony with the Tao, which is ever flowing like a river. And the wise person doesn't try and stop the flow of the river, nor is he swept away helplessly by it, but he learns to maneuver within it. 
to sense and use the flow and be part of it. One of the Taoist images that comes up is the uh, the mighty oak and the willow. The mighty oak is solid, strong. You know, and the, the willow is thin and wispy. But in a hurricane, the oak will be destroyed. It cannot yield, so its branches break. But the uh, the willow bends and yields to the forces of nature and then returns to its healthy state after the storm has passed. And when we do meditation of any kind, we're essentially working on a directed transformation of consciousness. In the Samatha meditation, The effort is to find a unity of mind, which is the meaning of samadhi, unity or stability of mind. And this transforms consciousness from the sensual desire plane to the the plane of form. Uh, this is what jhana is. It's an actually a phase shift in consciousness from one level or plane of existence to another. It's a transformation that is quite profound. In the Vipassana meditation, the effort is to be keenly aware of the process of consciousness and the flow of objects. And this is meant to engender the arising of wisdom. And with the penetration of the three characteristics, that is of emptiness, impermanence, and unsatisfactory or imperfect nature when that's seen with a penetrating clear sharp light of of wisdom then the whole process of samsara comes crumbling down it dissolves because the mind is not doing it anymore the mind can become liberated by seeing through the trick, seeing through Mars' trick, the illusion of satisfaction, the illusion of permanence, and the illusion of solidity. And with the disengagement or disenchantment, that is Nibida in Pali, when that factor is arisen, there's a waning of the energy of creating samsara. And this allows the arising of viraga or dispassion, the mode of force that keeps the wheel turning, wanes and dissolves. So the attachment of the mind to the samsaric process slips and is loosened. And then it's possible for the most profound transformation of all to occur and for the mind to alight upon the unconditioned. In Buddha Gosa's words, then the mind does that which it has not done since beginningless time and alights upon non-occurrence. And once Nibbana has been glimpsed, even briefly, that creates a turning in the depth, a profound transformation. It's such a radical reordering of the fundamental core of the being that 
it's impossible for such a being not to become fully enlightened within seven lifetimes. The direction of the being is now pointing towards release. So this is the kind of transformation ultimately that in the Buddhist path that we're working towards. Not the finding of a more favorable position within samsara, but release or escape from samsara altogether. Which is not to say that there's no value in improving your position provisionally within samsara. There's a story about one of the teachers of Ajahn Li. This is Ajahn Jotaka, who there's a book of uh, little stories about him. He was apparently quite a character, kind of Zen-like in his um, approach. And he once gave a talk that concerned questions of Abhidhamma. And one of his students, a young man, at the end of the talk protested, um, I don't want to practice a jhana meditation because then I'll just be reborn in the Brahma realm. And Ajahn Jodhako's response was, would you rather be reborn as a dog? (laughs) You find that some Buddhists tend to be a little flip and dismissive of the value of attaining higher levels of consciousness but still falling short of Nibbana. And while we should maintain, definitely maintain that our ultimate goal is Nibbana, that should always, always be the, the ultimate goal we're striving for. It's not that the other states of consciousness are without value. Purify the being and raise the level of consciousness is in itself a good thing. As I said earlier, you're transforming in each moment, no matter what, but you're either transforming upwards, you're either moving towards the Brahma realm, or you're transforming downwards, you're moving towards a dog state. Each choice, each action of body, speech, and mind is tending in one way or the other. And this transformation is continual. It's going on all the time. And beings that are not directing, self-directing their transformation, if they're not taking mastery of their own transformation, then they'll fall into that cycle of rising and falling. And there'll be no escape for them. And in these courses of transformation, you should recognize also that at this moment in time, you have taken a very fortunate rebirth, a rebirth of extreme rarity, something to often reflect on. Just the fact of being born human is in itself an extreme attainment, something that is a result of great merit and is rare. We tend to not understand or appreciate the rarity, the specialness of a human birth because there seems to be so many of us. And probably most of the people you know are human, so you sort of take it for granted, but even if we just consider the animal realm, the number of insects, the number of small beings living in the sea is unfathomably larger than the number of humans. And then already to be a human is rare enough, but to be a human 
born in a time and place when the Buddha's teachings are extant in the world and can be heard. That is even more rare because for most of the existence of human beings, there were no Buddha teachings. Whole aeons can go by without a Buddha arising. Whole world systems can come and go without the light of the Dhamma. So in this process of rising and falling, of transforming from one state of being to another, there's this window of a brief flicker in, in terms of cosmic time of human existence. And the opportunity there is maximal for liberation. The Devas and the Brahmas, they're more majestic, more luminous. They have great powers. They enjoy great bliss and pleasure. But they don't have the potential for liberation to the same degree as we do. The beings lower than us in the scale of being, animals and demonic beings, they're in such states of ignorance and suffering that they don't have a chance either. But here in the human realm, there is an ideal vehicle for realizing liberation in the human form. The prime reason for this is that here in the human realm, for the average run of humans, there is a mix in their life of pleasure and pain. The Dewas have very little suffering. They have a life of continual pleasure, so they don't perceive the possibility that there might be a problem. They don't see any need to investigate the nature of samsara and find a way out of it. The beings in the hell realms are so immersed in continual suffering that they don't have the opportunity or the liberty of movement of mind to be able to, to do anything. And the animals are just living in a state of ignorance and fear and hunger driven by these sort of base impulses and they don't see a way out. It's impossible for them to conceive of it. But the human beings have an existence where there's enough suffering that you know there's a problem and enough intelligence to be able to understand that. To see that existential dilemma of birth and death, what the Zen people call the great matter, you know? Here we are conscious beings, but at some point we were born and at some point we die. The day was very often they're so foolish they don't even conceive that they're mortal. It comes as a shock to them. Besides having suffering in our life, we also have, uh, our life is for most humans, I mean, there are some really unfortunate cases, but for most humans, life is not a continual round of suffering. There are moments of ease and pleasure, and there is enough freedom from gross suffering, enough space that there's an ability to investigate and an ability to practice, and the ability to have the mental room and space to direct the transformation. Because the transformation is going to happen whether you take control of it or not. If you don't direct it into higher states of being, you'll just drift. The samsarati, wander in circles. So I'll stop there.
Sadhu Karan Tata Mati Sadhu 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 Anumodani